from here, right? Check, check. Am I loud enough? Good, good? Yeah. All right, cool. Um, like you said, my name is Max Maxwell. I do live in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, so it's like uh, three hours or so from here. I might fall off the stage, so edit that out if that happens. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of backstory before I talk about real estate. Um, uh, when I, first of all, my, I'm the first born generation American. My parents are from Jamaica. Uh, my dad came over here on a student visa to go to college. Um, and shortly after I was born. Um, so I'm first generation American, so my parents don't have a lot of the, the skills that comes with being born in America, knowing stuff about credit, real estate, owning real estate or anything like that. Um, so I went through obviously high school, middle school. I moved to North Carolina in 1993. I went to elementary school, uh, middle, high school. And in high school, I, I was never a great student. Let's just put that out there. It wasn't that I was a troublemaker. I just didn't get good grades. I was terrible at school. And I didn't find out until the end of my sophomore year that I actually was dyslexic. So it was hard for me to read. It was hard for me to use numbers and stuff like that. And that's when I realized, okay, wait. So I had to pick up on other skills that helped me get past out of high school. To this day, I'm not really sure how I graduated. I think I was just nice enough and they wanted me out of there. So I got my, uh, got my diploma in 2002 and obviously I couldn't go to college. I was a great student athlete. I was recruited by Tennessee, a bunch of other, but I never took the SATs because I was afraid to. Um, I didn't have the grades to actually go to college. So I knew that was not an option for me. So at 17, I joined the United States Air Force and I was in the Air Force for four years active and then I came home. And when I came home at 21, so I went in at 17, I came home roughly about 21 and I got my broker's license um, in the state of North Carolina. And I was in the last class before they changed the law where you can get your real estate license and your broker's license at the same time as long as you went to school, sales school, and then you went to broker school back to back. So I came out, brand new agent, and I worked for a company called Allen Tate Real Estate, um, which is an independent firm. I, I think they're just in North Carolina. They may, may be more now. Um, so after that, um, I did regular real estate for about a year. I was sick and tired of driving people around on the weekends that actually did not buy a house. So I figured that this is not for me. And then I actually got learned about the investment side of real estate. Um, so I started my own property management company, property manage, uh, Infinity Property Management and Investments. I had no idea what I was doing. A buddy of mine was a mortgage broker. Uh, I walk into his office one day and he's on the phone with somebody. He's like, oh yeah, I got a property manager guy I know real well. I sit down in front of him and he starts to talk. He's like, yeah, I'll let you speak to him. It's a guy from California. Um, he starts talking about how he hates who he's working with now as far as property management. And here I am, I've, I have not managed one property at all, ever. All I know is I just got the logo made, got the LLC made, and then, then the state gave me. And here this guy says, would you, would you take a look at my portfolio? I said, sure. He said, well, I'm gonna send an email. And he sent an email to my friend John. John, look, I look at the Excel sheet, it's $13.5 million worth of property that he wants me to manage. I said, sure, I'll do it for 7.5%. No idea what I was doing. I took it, it ran well. We managed multifamily, single family, commercial for him. The guy only came to North Carolina about twice in his entire life, right? So he was strictly just an investor. Um, he would send me money, he would call and say, listen, I got $60,000, I want this type of yield, go find it. So we would go find property, fix it up, and get that type of yield form. Worked great for a while and then 2008 happened. But before that, he started selling property before most people knew that they needed to sell property. He pretty much sold his entire portfolio, probably 85% of it before the actual crash happened. So with that, all my business went to crap. I had nothing and then the crash happened and I really, really had nothing. Um, <laughs> so there I was on a high, obviously first time having money, you know, coming out the military, I think I was making, I was getting shot at for about 24,000, jumping out of airplanes for about $24,000 a year um, in all types of countries, you know, swimming through all types of crap. So I come home, do real estate, and I'm, on a, I'm making a lot of money. Well, that goes back to my parents not knowing much and not educating me about when you make money. So what did I do? I blew the money. I was doing one-way trips to New York City at Macy's. I would spend $5,000 at Macy's, and I would just do all the dumb stuff you do when you're in your 20s and you make a lot of money. So when the crash happened, I had nothing. I was broke. So I decided, you know what? I'm gonna leave and go to California. I had no idea why I would do that. So I'm in my Jeep, I drive 36 hours on I-40 all the way west. I stop twice at a rest stop to sleep because I don't have no money. The car is actually out for order of repo. 
Um, so I figured I had to go far. They wouldn't find me in California, right? <laughs> so I, I go to California. My cousin actually plays professional soccer at the time. And um, he was away at trip or something playing soccer. And I had to sleep in my car for a few days until he got home. I got home, I'm like, hey, I'm in California, can I stay with you? He's like, sure. He goes, like, Here goes I'm in a room with a futon in it, actually. So I was there in California, and I just completely nothing with real estate. I did some marketing stuff, traveled around, just being in my 20s again. And then I got a real job. Got a real job doing marketing uh, for a big company in Chicago. And then I got the bright idea. I was never a great employee either. I don't know if that, not a great student, not a great employee. I was just tired of having people that weren't as smart as me above me. So it, it was just bad for me to be an employee. So I left that job and tried to start an app. When I left that job in 2015, I came home. And I started an app, I got a little bit of funding, things were going okay, and then we didn't have any funding anymore. So that whole, you need money to run money, it was, that's not a true business when you create apps and raise money and you, anyways, that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> so um, I was flat on my face. I extended all my credit cards because I was living a lifestyle that I needed to keep up. And here I am at 30 years old, and I gotta move back to my mom's house with all these credit cards. So I'm upstairs in the same house that I grew up in, 30 years old. Uh, they did get the car though, by the way, uh, a while ago. So I didn't have a car at the time. So I went out and bought a car, I think it was like 800 bucks. It was a 2004 Volkswagen Jetta, right? How many of you guys got Volkswagens? Don't be afraid, I like Volkswagen, yeah. So I bought it very cheap, and uh, man, I tell you what, life was, <laughs> I was way down at that point. You're 30, you're back home. Um, keep in mind, I'm dyslexic. So I didn't read my first book cover to cover until I was 30, right? And it was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I read the book, obviously depressed, at mom's house, up in, upstairs in my room, and that book clicked for me. I don't know why it did, I don't know. I enjoyed the story in the book. It took me a long time to read that little book, but I got it. And then I found out about audiobooks. And I was like, holy crap. So I read it again, and then I read it again. So I would go to the gym, gym membership, you know, was cheap, so I can keep that. And um, let me tell you how bad my car was before we get started. So the 2004 Volkswagen Jet, it looked clean. I mean, it was silver, had the cloth interior, but had a bad starter. How many of you guys ever had a bad starter on a car? <laughs> exactly, right? So I had the hammer in the passenger seat. <laughs> you got, if you're laughing, you know what's going on here, okay? Obviously, I can't afford to get the starter. Yeah, so you got to tap the starter. So what happens is when you get out the gym, we used to go to the gym 6 o'clock in the morning. We'd get done like 7.30. We would, I would go in the car, let all my friends leave, right? <laughs> I'd sit in the car on my phone like I got some stuff to do. As they leave, I'd, I'd hop out the car, look around, pop up the hood, tap the starter, leave the hood. Because you, you guys you don't know if it's going to start, so you don't close the hood all the way. You leave it, hop back in the car, hope it cranks. It didn't crank, so I used to do that all the time. Literally, I would bang the hanger and it just became frustrated. I was like, I gotta do something. I gotta do something. So one of my friends, uh, his dad is very successful in real estate. And I went to his house one day and I was just sitting in the basement, just overly frustrated and I, I'm, he's talking about his portfolio and how rich he is. I'm like, God, another one of these guys. And he says, and he says the word wholesaling. And he was like, yeah, this is the entryway to real estate without having any money. I was like, that sounds just like me, <laughs> right? So I Google it, conversation's done, I go home and I just go on YouTube, I go on podcasts, and I literally stay upstairs for three weeks, right? And any of you guys have foreign parents, that's not good, right? Because when they cook, you gotta eat the moment it comes off the, the, the fork, right? So my mom thinks I'm depressed because I'm not eating as soon as she say food is ready. And um, I just learned everything I can about wholesale, at least what I thought I could, in those actual three weeks. You know what, I get in the car, hit the hammer with the starter, I get in the car and I just start driving. And I find a house in an old neighborhood of mine that I grew up on the same street, two blocks up. It's a corner house, I see it, and I'm like, holy crap. You know, this is what they've been talking about on these videos, driving for dollars. So I look up, since I was a real estate agent, I knew how to look on the geodata. Got in the geodata, I found the person, it was aired to them, so it was, de it was given to them in a probate situation, and she was behind on taxes, and it was vacant. It was like the perfect first house. That started my real estate career. I found that house, 
I met the lady at a Waffle House. I never forget the exit or where it was. I got it signed. I sold it in 48 hours and I made $14,000. And I was like, you know what? I'm back. <laughs> I did not get my starter fixed. I kept going. I put all that money in what I thought was done correctly and I, st I started getting direct mail and all that stuff and that didn't work. A week later, I got my next deal, $7,000. I got it from a Craigslist ad and it just kept going and going. So very quickly, in my mom's attic, I made over $800,000 in that, in, that, in that attic while I was there. Wow. Now, obviously now I'm making money, but I'm very smart now because I remember what happened last time. So I just start hoarding money. I keep money and I start building. I have more, I have more, I couldn't even tell my mother how much money I had because she would go crazy. I don't think she would believe me. So I just kept hoarding money, hoarding money. And then I said, I got to make this an actual business. And then I started to repeat it and I started to grow. And that's when I took out the camera and started my YouTube channel and said, hey, I'm making 30 something thousand dollars a month. I have no idea what I'm doing, but follow me as I grow. <laughs> and that's what, ha that's what created my YouTube channel. And um, so as of now, I have a full business. I have uh, nine employees. Uh, last year we did a little over $1.8 million in wholesaling. Um, and what's cool about wholesale, and I tell people, I know there's a lot of passive people, there's note investors, there's people that have active money. What wholesaling has allowed me to do is basically create an ATM machine, right? Because you can't invest in real property if you don't have any money, essentially, right? It's hard to have buy and holds if you don't have money. So now, every first, so what my strategy now is I buy a rental every other month, or this week I bought three because the prices just made, made sense, right? So being able to have this ATM machine, I've built my own personal portfolio to the point where, you know, I could probably retire right now, just in short years. Now, I didn't mention my first contract was September 28th, 2016. We're now in January of 2019, and I have a multi-million dollar wholesaling business and a multi-million portfolio. So we do wholesaling, we do a little bit of fix and flips, and I have my rentals. So that's the power of actual wholesaling. And a lot of people say, well, you know, I think wholesalers are looked down upon as dirty, right? Because there is some things that people do unethical, but there's realtors that do things unethical, there's note buyers that do things unethical. Mortgage companies created the collapse in 2008, seven. So everybody, everybody has an option to be good or bad no matter what they do, right? So a good wholesaler can be very, 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 uh, you know, effective in the community of creating deals in the ecosystem of real estate. So I tell anybody, if you're going to be investing in real estate, I don't care what form or fashion, learn how to wholesale because it gives you the opportunity to be at the beginning of a deal. And that's what real estate is. It's finding things at the beginning and getting it cheaper than it's actually worth. So I don't care if you're note buying because I know guys that wholesale only to sell their deals to people that want to rehab it and then they sell them the note at the same time to fix and flip the same property. So I just see that people really need to open their mind and, and find out you know, the beginning of a wholesale deal, find the wholesale deal because wholesaling is very powerful. Um, and, it, and the reason why I think it's powerful because a lot of realtors, as I was, don't like to list houses that are just, just don't work, right? We, as a realtor, how many realtors in here? agents, realtors, right? So, you know, you walk, you get, first of all, you get your real estate license and you want to list every most expensive house in whatever area that you are, right? That's the story that you want to be. That's the picture that's painted to you as a realtor. But the reality is if I was a realtor now, I would list everything that ever came across my desk. I would tell nobody to never do any repairs because we're in such a market where you can just type as is and things get sold a lot faster. So the deals that the realtors don't want to deal with, we essentially deal with them as wholesalers. And we actually go out and find deals that most people don't know exist. So uh, wholesalers are a very, very essential part of the ecosystem of real estate. Um, I'm pretty sure I don't have to sit here and tell people how to wholesale, and that's not kind of why I came here to, came here to do. Um, but I think I, my message is just to come here and say what's important about wholesaling. And wholesaling is important. It is an ethical way and an unethical way to do it. Um, and I know there's some people in here that are following, like I have a 30 day challenge where I'm teaching people to go out and find deals and stuff like that. So I give a lot away of my information for free. I don't have a course. I don't have anything like that. I don't make money by being a teacher or a mentor. I literally I just enjoy my life and the things that I've learned over the last few years, I just give to people that want to receive it. Um, so I, I really love real estate and I know you guys do. Um, I, I like to have this talk here and then we like to go in Q&A probably more about what's, whole, like what's wholesaling or any selfish questions that you have.
um, I'm, I'm actually here to learn stuff too because I want to learn more about note investing and multifamily and stuff like that. So the thing is, the thing that I put off is I, I don't know everything about real estate, nor do I pretend to. I'm just pretty decent at wholesaling. And I've lucked up with timing and business to be able to make a lot of money so that I can go out and invest in things that make sense uh, for me as well. So um, if you guys have any questions about wholesaling or about anything that I'm doing, I'll be happy to ask the, answer those questions. And uh, if not, then cool. Tell people how to do driving for dollars. I yeah. think you're very good at teaching. Yeah, so driving for dollars is a method, basically how I found my first property. And it also helps you learn the actual market that you're in. You basically fill up your car with gas and you drive around in neighborhoods that are considered maybe good, hot, places that are actively flipping and stuff like that. And uh, what we do is we drive in the neighborhoods and we write down the addresses. Now they have apps. Uh, there's an app called Deal Machine that I use very heavily. And we just take pictures of the actual house with this app and it sends an automatic postcard to the person saying, hey, is this your house? I wanna buy it. Now that's so easy, anybody in this room can do it. And we, send, we add about 200 or so properties to that app every single month. My team does as they're out you know, going to the grocery store, they might cut in and cut in a neighborhood they've never been in. But driving for dollars is very essential. I think one of the important things that uh, I, in my first year, I recovered 300 and I think 330, $328,000 worth of back taxes that the city was owed on properties. And I think when I, so when I speak at the city council meetings and, and they talk about what, you know, what is wholesaling, what is stuff you do, and, and I tell them simply it's just an exit strategy for investing. But more importantly, you have to look at what we actively do by driving for dollars in these neighborhoods where you have a string of nice houses and you have that one house that's like, oh my God, would somebody cut the grass? Would somebody wash the siding? You know, those are the houses that we go after and usually those things have delinquent taxes. So, you know, in our first year getting the $330,000 in back taxes, that was able to buy more books, police cars, buses, for the city and stuff like that. So I think that's another reason you just help clean up your neighborhood even if you just don't care about the money, right? So driving for dollars is very important. One, because you get to learn the market that you're actually in, see who's actually rehabbing on what streets and see what, how, see what for sale signs go up, see who's under contract, and then it allows you to actually look at houses that are crap and try to get them turned into something. And any flippers in here? Yeah, you, you guys drive, I'm assuming you drive in areas and say, oh, because you love an area. As a flipper, you love a zip code, you love boundaries of some streets, and you're like, anything in this area, I know I know what to do with it and make good money. So uh, driving for dollars is very important. And if you don't want to do it, what we do is we hire other people, Uber drivers, um, you know, uh, anybody that is just out there, uh, people that deliver mail. And we say, listen, if you, want, if you drive for dollars, and what you can do is you can get that app and give them a login and say, hey, if you drive for dollars and you, sh you bring me a house that I buy, I'll give you a thousand bucks. And then you have an army of people out there looking for houses for you and every morning you wake up, you got 10, 15 houses that you can look for. And then you don't have to buy that flip from a wholesale. Not that I'm trying to kick wholesales out the game, but you can save yourself 10, 15, $20,000 on a flip because you bought it direct from the owner. Any questions? Any more questions? What's the name of that app? Uh, Deal Machine. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. The uh, ones that you did for delinquent taxes? Yes, ma'am. Did you go to the owners first? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Uh, because the owners still hold title, they're just, uh, so in North Carolina, I'm not sure about Virginia, we're, we're a uh, deed foreclosure state, so we don't do liens. Uh, so the, the, if you're late on your taxes, they can foreclose on your house and sell it to recoup their, their, uh, their losses. Yeah, and, and there's also a strategy of that. So if you know there's a two-year wait limit, then you can actually then target somebody that was in the last two years or the year and a half before so that you can start. Because what happens is the marketing is already done by the city or the county, and they're receiving these letters in the mail that say, hey, look, you got three months. You got one month. Hey, I'll see you at the courthouse next week. You know, and then if you hit those people at the right time, you can get those deals. A lot of people don't know they have options when, these, when they get these letters. And, and as real estate investors, we also have to educate the people going through these situations so that they, ha they know that they have options to use. Here, Christine, I'm going to ask you Yeah. So everyone can hear you. How did you get your buyer's list? Um, real simple. Uh, I found out where buyers hang out. Um, so most buyers like to buy from auctions. The auctions in, in North Carolina are usually held at the courthouse steps. 
and uh, North Carolina has a 10 day upset bid period. So that means uh, the auction happens live on a Wednesday, let's say at 11 o'clock and a bid is placed for 100,000. That bid has to sit open for 10 days to allow anybody else to come down and actually write a new bid, which is 5% more or $750, whatever is higher. And what happens is when they fill out those forms, you get all their information. So they're giving the clerk of court their name, their address, their cell phone number to be contacted. And that's all public information. So we literally go down to the courthouse. We look at the upset bid book, whether it's online in your county or person, and we literally just take screenshots. And I have somebody in my office that says, hey, we're calling from Cash Homes, try it. I see that you uh, like to buy properties. Can you tell me a little bit more like what you have to buy? And that's somebody's sole job is to build a buyer's list. And that's why when we get a property on a contract, we sell them in 24 hours. We send out a blast email, a blast text, and a blast voicemail, and we sell them like that. Yes, ma'am. So can you, you said you have nine employees. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So one thing I have is a transaction coordinator. So she's like my office admin slash transaction coordinator. She's very important because what happens when a person goes out and gets a contract, she takes over as the li liaison between the closing attorney and the actual seller. She guides them and sets the expectations of what happens next so that, that we don't have any hiccups, right? Because we all know real estate can be sticky if somebody doesn't have constant communication. So once we get a property under contract, she's calling them every two days just to make sure to walk them through the process. She takes care of all the paperwork and all that stuff. I have four active cold callers in the office. So their job is to, so I'll, I'll back up. So I have two marketing strategies. I have a wide marketing strategy and a deep marketing strategy. And the wide one is we go after people such as like empty uh, absentee owners. Absentee owner is simply somebody that owns a house that does not live in it. So the tax billing address and the tax mailing address, yeah, the actual address and the tax mailing address don't add up, which means that they do not live in the property. And then we blanketly call or email or text or, or whatever we do to reach those people. Those are wide. So I have four more employees that actually live in the Philippines that do that type of stuff over there. But the deep stuff, such as probates, tax delinquent, uh, first filing of foreclosure, vacant. Uh, we have this thing called the water list. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. The water list is essentially if the water is owned by the city or county, you can request information from them and say, hey, give me every property that has not had water in six months. And they'll usually shoot that to you in Excel list. Sometimes it takes a little accent, 10 people, 20 people before you get it. But that's a list of houses that have not had water in six months. Guess what those things are? vacant right so that's one of the lists is, lists we, we we work out we do stuff like that and I've pulled them in multiple cities multiple states you can get it as long as it's a as long as it's, it's publicly owned and not a private company a private company does not have to disclose that to you so lists like that my internal call callers are calling now they're only responsible for calling 40 people a day I know it sounds small but if you add that up and they're going, actual, they're going after actual problem people, right? So there goes five and then I have two, I have a sales manager slash acquisitions manager and then another acquisitions person, right? And then I have somebody that solely is on the disposition side of the business. So their job is we get a property on the contract, they create the emails, they put, the, they put it on our, our website, they send out the text blast, the voicemail blast, to our buyers and they're solely responsible for gathering so many buyers every week, right? So that's kind of the outlay of our office. And then you have myself, which is the ninth person, and I just oversee everything to make sure things work. Yes, ma'am. I'm Max. Where, where I'm we at? Jamar Smith. Sorry, I'll get right to you. I'm from Norfolk, Virginia, and I'm definitely inspired by all of your YouTube videos. Thank you. I wanted to know when I close my first deal, what's the first thing I should do with my check? Uh. Put it in the bank and do the first thing you did to get the first deal without money. Right. Because that's what I did. Like I had zero dollars. So if driving for if you found your first deal driving for dollars, go drive for dollars again. Then go drive for dollars again and repeat that step until you can start hiring an army of people and put that money away. Right. Because eventually you're going to come across a wholesale deal. I picked up a wholesale deal. Uh, I think it was Tuesday. I bought a house that had a tenant in it. It's worth tax value, right? It was like 58. The guy's retiring from Piedmont Airlines, or now US Airways, and he wanted 18,000 for it. I offered him 16.5. It had a tenant in it. I literally just wrote a check because I have an attorney downstairs and said, it's, thank you. 
So literally, I'll get my money back in less than two years on that. And that's what I mean by, and, and so I literally took 16.5, turned it into cash flow, and turned 16.5 into, you know, 65,000 on paper, right? So you'll have, if you have that money, don't, and here's what I say. I talk a million miles a minute. Sorry, guys. I'm so excited about real estate. Do not look at a business like mine and think you have to do that when you're just a one man shop, one woman shop. You understand what I'm saying? Stay basic until you get to that level where you have to start hiring people. Don't go out and do X amount of mailers. Don't go out and buy this software, that software. Keep doing what you're doing because if it took you one month to get one deal and you made 10 grand, do you know how many Americans don't make $10,000 a month? Right, so don't scale until you're forced to scale. Right, it's not all about looking pretty and saying I got eight employees. I wish I had one employee, right? Because that overhead is a killer sometimes, right? So, you know, make sure that you only scale when you need to. So take some of that money, put, obviously put some back into marketing, but literally put in the bank. I, you know, the IRS wants some too. So put in the bank, you know, and, and wait for it. And then just do what you did again until you repeat the process till you can turn it into a system. I really like that. Hang on, I'm bringing the mic. From Alabama, here you go. And then right after that, Jim, we, she was actually next, but we'll go okay. boom, boom like that. Hey, Max. How you doing? Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so you mentioned, I got two questions, actually. Mm -hmm. The first one, do you use a, any kind of website to actually find your pre-foreclosures absentee owners? And whenever you do find them, do you direct mail them? What's yeah, so that's, that's real, real uh, yes. So I do use a website called ListSource to get absentee owners. Um, the thing is I pay three cents a lead and most people pay 30 cents. So that's the business you have to get hacks. Do you have a, do you, do you I work? I use list source. Do you pay the 30 cents? I don't pay three cents or whatever you mentioned. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know what I pay. <laughs> there's a guy named Todd Swaggerty that owns a company called Yellow Letters HQ. Right, and if you uh, give him $99 a month, he's on the old plan that is no longer available. He'll give you a login and access to use ListSource and buy it at three cents. If you buy one list, it's worth it for the rest of the year. So that's an advantage. I already buy lists 10 times cheaper than my competition, so I can buy 10 times as much data. Right, so ListSource is how I find absentee owners um, and you can go after exactly what you want. So if you're just looking for multifamily, you can go at, you know, look, you can just search for multifamily. If you're going from uh, trailer parks, you can just go after trailer parks. Um, for, what was the other list you asked me about? Um, Pre-foreclosure. Pre Pre-foreclosure. So in the state of North Carolina, um, we have a process, and this is where I, I dive deep. So I read the state statute to find out what is required by the state and the process they have to follow in order to foreclose. And one of those things is that usually how it works in the state of North Carolina is the mortgage company hires a trustee. And the moment that trustee is hired, they have to file a paperwork saying that they became a trustee for this mortgage company on this property. So we know where those are filed in the courthouse. We literally go to the clerk of court. I say, I need the trustee book. And we go in there, we simply, and that's usually 90 days before you're even having a court hearing. So we usually just go in there and we start writing, taking pictures. And that's how we find out, we call those pre-pre-foreclosures because that's usually at the same time that, a, pre, that a, uh, a notice of default letter is sent out to the homeowner. You guys enjoying this? Yeah. Yep. I know you are, so am I. Hey, uh, so how do you handle uh, title checks, title issues, Good. dealing with title? Absolutely. Here's what I did. When we started making a lot of money, I hired an attorney. So I have an attorney downstairs for $100,000 a year. So I can get a title search done in 15 minutes. Um, for you that don't have that luxury, um, become friends with an attorney. Um, ask them how they like to do business. And if you be, believe it or not, I know most attorneys, you know, want to seem busy all the time. And some of them are. But they do have time to do the stuff. And if you just go approach them in a great manner and tell them what you're doing, um, and you, we started bringing a lot of business to our attorney, and that's how we, you know, we started talking and talking. And when he was ready to retire, I said, nope, I don't want you to retire. I want to retain you and just do my stuff. So that is, uh, that's important. That's how we check titles. But here's the thing. All of our contracts that we get when we purchase properties, it's based upon obtaining clear title. So I don't care if it has clear title at the moment. As long as I can get it under contract, remember the contract, you control the property at that point. And then once we take it to title, if we find out it doesn't work, don't worry about it. 
But what we do like is we do go, since I do have an attorney on in staff that's been in real estate for 17 years, we do go after problem title properties because he can literally look on a computer, follow the history of the title, and map out a solution, and we'll do cash for deeds all day long. <coughs> right? We know that it'll take us 90 days, but a property that would, we would have bought for 100000 I can pay 6000 for it because everybody passed up on it. So the legal is part of your team? Yeah, absolutely. All right, Bubba? Uh, it sounds like um, you're getting the, your calls is the most productive. Uh, yeah, cold calls. We're yeah. crazy on cold that's calls. That's what I want to implement in my business. So if you could just talk about, I know you're using VAs from the Philippines, like how you set it up. You have to use like a dialer or just kind of use a little background yes. on how you, how you run that process. So my guys overseas, they use uh, Mojo, which a lot of real estate agents use. And they dial between, I think, five and 650 leads a day. But that's on my, my wide list. I mean, just because you own a house in North Carolina and you live in Missouri don't mean you want to sell, right? But that's who I make them go after. Um, the guys inside the office, right? It's actually an all-women team, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> they actually call motivated, problem-identified potential people. And uh, they're on a regular phone. And they're just dialing like that. But if you want a mass call, um, you want, I told you I was going to fall off. Uh, if, you get, if you do a mass call, you want to use Mojo. We have a triple line. And essentially what a triple line does is it calls three numbers at once. The first person that picks up, it hangs up the other three. You talk to that person, it dials three more. It's over and over again, right? And that's, that's I think, I think, what is it, a hundred bucks maybe? So you're a U.S. based caller, uh, caller. How do you, what's the comp structure that we're, is, would be? Yeah, so everybody, every, and they all have a base salary of $500 a week, and they have 10% of what we call spread. So if we make $100,000 on a deal, they'll make 10 grand. If we make $10,000 on a deal, they'll make 1,000 bucks. Incentive. Yeah. Let's see, uh, Ken, I think you're- I give them enough money for ramen noodles, and true salespeople love that because their potential's endless right. if they work on commission. So I don't know how many other states have an upset bid process like North Carolina, but you said something extremely valuable. Mm -hmm. And if you go back six years ago, I went to the courthouse steps and was looking at the auctions and some guy bypassed the, the starting bid and went straight to a higher bid. And I asked him afterwards, why did you do that? He said, because of the upset bid process. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is this, the upset bid list, Mm -hmm. If that's a vetting process in itself, mm -hmm. so you screen anything that anybody would bid on. What percentage is there? A percentage of those that you're are still have meat on the bone because you're you're now bidding five percent or seven hundred fifty dollars more mm -hmm. um, on all of those. Um, this is hugely valuable yeah. because. Because that was a hurdle that six years ago made me say, well, this isn't worth it. Yeah. That was six years ago. So here's the, here's the crazy thing. So we, we look at the upset bid book to get buyers. But another thing we do, I don't know if this is real, but we created this thing called auction sniping. Because we have the upset bid period in North Carolina, deals can go like this for three months. Because these guys will come bid the minimum every time. And here's what we do. We go to the homeowner because the, the, the deed has not transferred nor it's been confirmed by a clerk of court. So guess who still owns the property? They do. So we go knock on their door, we call them, and they said, oh yeah, the house went to auction two months ago. I said, you're right, but I am willing to give you cash for your deed. And let's just say the house is worth, let's just say the ARV on the house is 150. It's up for auction for, you know, they got $65,000 in back taxes. If you write them a $10,000 check and go to the clerk of court and pay that $65,000 taxes, then you're winning. You just, I, you know how many times I've walked past people that were bidding on us? I got it, the deed, it's over. <laughs> you know, I do it, I do it all the time. I, I do it all, I bought, a, I bought a rental property that was, somebody was, somebody passed away. They owed $17,000 on a mortgage. It was inherited by three sisters. The sisters did not have the money to pay the mortgage, nor did they care to. So at the, at the auction, 
the house is valued like 110 fixed up, just a rental house. And at the auction, uh, people were bidding on it. I think the auction price was like 55,000 at that time. We called, we researched, we skipped trace, we found the heirs. There was a niece that helped me. I called, because I call all the family members too. There was a niece that helped me find the heirs. And what we did is I gave her $1,000 to go wrangle all of them. I gave each one of them $3,000. And then I had to go pay off the $17,000 mortgage from, from a legacy uh, credit union. So I got that property for about $27,000 and it was bidded on at the auction, had a current auction price around 50, 55. So that is the difference between understanding, and I say really digging deep and understanding the process because all these things are legal processes that have to happen. You just want to get in front of it the fastest, right. right? Just because you have money doesn't mean you actually know how to invest in real estate. Because I had no money and I had to learn the process with, the, with thinking that I don't have any money. I could have easily sold that property for 55 grand and made money, but I was selfish and I kept it. <laughs> okay. but you guys just bypassed 95% of everybody at your REA Correct. by knowing what that is. You like that, Correct. don't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you pulling title to every property prior to approaching the homeowner to make an offer for the deed? Nope. You want, you want to know why? Yeah. yeah, because I'm not going to go right. I'm not physically writing a check at the door. I'm getting it on a contract to say I'm going to do it. And now that I have that piece of paper and it says I'm going to give you money in three days, then I'm going to go do title. But if I don't get my name on that contract, you can come right behind me while I'm doing a title search and say, I don't care. It's 10 grand. I've wasted more money doing whatever you do. You know what I mean? So. <laughs> Kevin from Indianapolis. Yeah, I've done a lot of the, the tax stuff like you're doing. We mm -hmm. do a lot of business with the tax mm -hmm. sale buyers, the bidders. Um, we actually track hedge funds who are buyers, and then we find out, we go to the owner direct and sort of scalp it. Uh oh, mm -hmm. yeah. But we get great deals that way. Um, have you ever thought about doing just delinquent taxes? So I look up to see who's delinquent about a month or two before. I know the tax list is going to go out to all the other investors, and that way I've got a lead on them. We can see people who have code violations attached to the property, so we can see people have property taxes over $5,000. We hit those before the mm -hmm. list even comes out. Absolutely. So that's one of our, so we created a program we call a scraper. Because yeah, this, scrape. exactly. So, exactly. The, so literally, we paid a guy in Pakistan maybe 200 bucks to develop a scraper that. <laughs> well, that's expensive. Yeah, <laughs> no, really, it is. <laughs> that literally goes on the tax websites and digs out anybody that's two years or more behind on taxes, exactly. and we put them in our cycle on the calls, on the the letters, on the text messages, because we want to jump in front of the problem as early as possible, right? Because in my business, I know we're real estate investors, but I'm literally a problem solver. All I'm trying to do is solve somebody's problem. And that's it. And I need to identify the problem as early as possible. Yeah, we scrape uh, divorce records, evictions. Absolutely. Anything that's scrapable, we'll, we'll find. So another thing that we do is we go after dissolved LLCs and match it with the county records on who, at, if those LLC owns properties. So that's another thing. Very good. If you want to get deals other people are not getting, you've got to go after data that they don't know about. Correct. It's, it's a data-driven business. It's a data-driven business. I've heard a lot of them do. Starting with a walk, I like that one. Mm -hmm. How are you dealing with the laws uh, regarding contacting people, uh, like unwanted solicitations, cold call, telemarketers, robo call, stuff like that? Yeah, so um, <laughs> there is a, uh, there's a thing called risk versus reward. <laughs> and uh, I've made enough money to sit back to where I'll pay a couple of FCC fines if I need to. But we've done research to find out now, I don't tell people to go out and do that. That's not what I just said. I'm just telling you what we do. Um, there's literally one person in the federal government that is in charge of that. One person. And you guys, if you're using Mojo Dollar, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Max, but I think you can actually screen out people on the do not call list. Yes, you absolutely can. So that, that's how you would do it if you want to go that way. We've spent a lot of money with uh, those attorneys, and they talk about gray lines. They talk about this you can and can't do. It all comes down to, to the intent of the call. If I'm calling with them to intent to make money, then I'm wrong, right? But it's also how you approach people too, right? If you do it in a, uh, a nice manner, 
then you're not going to have that problem. Um, we've had people try to complain and we just explain to them what happens and it kind of goes away. In making so many calls, and I don't even want to throw out a number because I don't know, I've never had somebody complain to the FCC. I've had people call me and want me to explain to them why we do it or what we're doing. But yes, there is a more safe way. It's called mail. You can do mail if you like. Yeah, we, we did a lot of outbound calling and I'm not a, an agent or a broker. Me neither. So I'm not soliciting. Um, I'm offering, if I call to, to buy your Camino that's in your driveway and you say no, that's fine. I'm not trying to sell you any services. I'm not soliciting in any way. Now it's strange because I learned when we were cold calling, I would say, hey, is this Ryan Reynolds? Yeah. Hey, I'm calling about your property. And he would say, uh, hey, you're soliciting. I don't want, you know, I don't want, I'm going to call the Attorney General. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I must have dealt the wrong number. I just hang up. <laughs> he must have thought I was crazy. He knew his name. I had his phone <laughs> But those people never turn you. He probably thought, oh, that poor guy. It's a long person. Now, one thing we do scrape against is the litigator list. There you go. Right? So there's a list called the litigator list. I forget where we buy it from. But those are people that basically they're alive to sue. Yeah. And they're known to sue. And we just scrape those. And there's not many people on those lists either. And I do know somebody personally that is, that is being fined very heavily for calling off the do not call list right now. So yeah. it is a relevant question. It is very relevant. There it goes. Who said that? Yeah. What was it called? Litigatorscrub.com. Litigator and it essentially takes any list you have and you can scrub it against it to take away people that are known to just sue based upon any violation that you're going to have. And you can scrape the do not call list if, if that's what you want to do. Well, thanks for all the information. We, um, about three months ago, started doing the cold calling mm -hmm. using VAs. So I have a, a problem, it's a good problem, but yeah. how did you handle, because all of a sudden the volume of calls mm -hmm. just skyrocketed, and we have call rail, so mm -hmm. we use different, you know, Love it. but um, we're missing calls, because we're getting too many calls, mm -hmm. we tried a answering service and that didn't work mm -hmm. out, so how did you solve that problem? So essentially what we have in the daytime is we have uh, my VA overseas is actually the first person you talk to when you call my company. I know it sounds crazy. She speaks perfect English. She's been with me for over a year. She's well trained. And that's what I think a lot of people miss when they hire virtual assistants. She is no different than somebody in my office. I spend a lot of time training them. I pay them well. They make three times the amount of salary that uh, an average person makes in their country. So they're dedicated to learning the craft that I, I apply to them to learn. Um, what we do is when I had that same problem and what we did is we had to taper off what we were doing in the beginning Right because you don't want to have that missed opportunity of so many calls So what we do is we slow that down and now what we do is we still have Leica. She still answers most of the calls But what happens is if she goes past a certain amount of rings it starts to rings to the sale agents inside the office on a round robin. So if you have call rail, you know how to put it on round robin after so many rings, and that's what happens. So we try not to miss any calls, but unfortunately, look, we're just normal. I mean, you can call the billion dollar company and be on hold for 17 minutes before you get uh, somebody to answer. So just leave a, a voicemail, a, a nice voicemail, tell them to leave a message, and uh, more than likely, if they're actually interested in what you have, they're gonna, they're gonna leave a message anyways. Okay. You guys are into lead generation. Yeah. All right, Chris, you had a question? You had a comment, okay. Uh, we were here, the here, there. Um, I was wondering what's your process, especially if you're in different markets, for teaching your people how to make offers when all the comps are different and it can take time to look up the ARVs and stuff like that. Believe it or not, I've done all my business in North Carolina. Beautiful North Carolina. Um, we just branched out into Columbus, Ohio. And uh, what we're doing is we're just trying to pick off low-hanging fruit. Um, so what we'll do is we will offer a certain, we'll come up with a formula based off Zillow. Hate to say it, but we'll come up with a formula based off Zillow at like 50%. All right, who is next? Come. Can you give us an idea either on the phone or at the front door, just a quick script of what you say when the people answer? <laughs> sure. Um, so are you doing an outbound call? Yeah, so there's a couple ways to do it. Um, what we do is we actually don't sound professional. That's one thing we do, right? If you're too professional, you're gonna get hung up on. What I wanna come across of when you answer the phone is the guy next door looking to buy a house, right? Um, what, f rule number one, never ask for the person you're looking for. Just assume, because you get the same answer regardless. 
What's your name? Kim, right? Yep. If I call you and say, is this Kim? If it's you, you're going to say yes, but you're going to be apprehensive because you should, I, you should know when I, I should know your voice when you say hello, right? If I say, hey, Kim, you're going to say, yeah, hey, how you doing? Now, if you were not, if your name was not Kim and I said, hey, Kim, you say, oh, you have the wrong number. But if I call and ask, hey, is this Kim? You have the option to still say this is the wrong number. So you still get the same answer as how you phrased in the beginning. So I never asked for the person. So, you know, we call, say, hey, hey, Kim, this is Max. I'm calling about the, uh, the house on 123 Main Street. Uh, yeah. Now, I, do I have the right number? Because I'm not even sure if I'm calling the right person. Yeah, yeah, this is Kim. OK, great. I was in the neighborhood just the other day, and somebody told me that you might be interested in selling that house. Well, who, who told you? Well, there was a guy. I was parked in front. There was a guy walking a dog, and he said, and I stopped. We talked, and he said, I think they're trying to sell that house. What neighborhood doesn't have a dog, somebody walking a dog? <laughs> right? So you're, you're, even though we buy 10 to 12 houses a month, we still want to come off as the guy that's just buying one. Mm -hmm. Right? And the same thing with voicemails. When we leave voicemails, it's very apologetic. I learned this from a buddy of mine named John Martinez. He's, he's very, apo very apolo apologetic. He's like, you know, uh, it's, and if we leave, we leave, we use RVMs, so that's ringless voicemail, so we don't say a name. And you can say, hey, hey, my name is Max. Um, I'm not even sure if I got the right number. Um, I'm, calling, I'm, I'm calling about a house I think you might have for sale. Now, if I got the wrong number, just I completely apologize. I'm sorry, just ignore this message. But if I do have the right number, hey, look, give me a call back. Even shoot me a text message. Um, I'd love to talk to you about that house. That simple. Now, if you hear that voicemail versus, hey, my name is Max Maxwell with Cash Homes Triad. I'm a local real estate investor. I'm interested in buying your house. Which one are you going to call back? You gonna call back Max down the street or Max that's in a, uh, on the 45th floor in an office downtown? Good tips. <laughs> Solid gold. And one thing as far as like in the house negotiation real quick, when we go to a house, the thing that I do, I also learned this from John Martinez, the thing that I do is I, also, I, I, I use a strategy called going negative. So I, I do not present myself as the only option or the best option when I walk into a house. I usually walk into a house and I'm like, Man, you know what? Even this, even if it smells like cat everywhere, even if it, even if it's got a hole in the roof that's not a skylight, I li literally, I walk in and I say, you know, this house is not that bad. Why don't you just fix it up and sell it yourself? Oh, I don't, I don't want to do. I don't have the money. No, no, I know people that give money based upon the value of the asset. They're called hard money lenders. I could probably get you a loan from a guy I know. I don't, you know, you can fix it up, and, you know get get uh, contractors in here and in six months you'll be on the market I don't want to fix it up I don't know nothing about contractors well, why don't you list it with a realtor I don't want people running through my house so you start giving them all these options and guess who's left at the end <laughs> right so that's called going negative I, I put myself at the end of being I start I have them start eliminating what their possibilities are I like that it's called give somebody permission to say no. Absolutely, There's from the a book beginning. On it by Jim Camp called Start With No. Great book on negotiating. All right, Martine, a when, young wholesaler. When I go to a house, when I go to a house, I'm usually batting about 50 to 60%. If you want to sell it, I'm getting it. Wow. Right? Because we have now we have options. I've educated myself. I know sub twos. I know all these other type of things. I'm 50 to 60% <laughs> if I walk in your house and you're actually interested in selling. Because I also have a broker that works in my office that if you were any, I mean, there's any portion of you wanting to sell this house, I got an option for you. Whether you want to list it or sell it to me cash or give it to me on terms, I got an option for you. Okay. Hey, How you doing? Oh, turn it on. Sorry. It's sliding. Okay. I think it's on now. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, this is my first, I heard you speak before and you talked about the water list, so mm -hmm. I went out to try to get the water list, and they said I had to fill out a FOIA for it, but it had to be for a specific address. How do you get a list of all the properties? Is it a count? Is it county? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you don't. Um, they're going to tell you everything. I had a friend that uh, sent a proposed lawsuit to the person they talked to and the city attorney telling them that they need to give this information to them. It's literally public information. As long as you say, I'm not going to go market to these people, right? So my email to them is, hey, I'm a speaker. I am, right? I'm speaking now. I speak at the restaurants. I speak to my mom. I'm a speaker. 
and I'm doing some research on uh, vacant properties in this county. Now, I have some data from the United States Postal Service. See, I just mentioned another government entity, so they feel comfortable. Uh, I have some data for the United States Postal Service, but I'm also looking to get some more data just to make sure my numbers, my statistics are good. Now, what I need is a, a list of houses that do not have water for the last six months or more. And I usually type that all in an email, I'll send it out to a couple people, because usually on the city website, the county website, Waterworks, there is people listed there, the, 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 the billing manager, the, the utility manager. You just send the email out and see what you get back. And then if you have to escalate it all the way to a proposed lawsuit, you can, uh, any attorney will file that for you for like 300 bucks. Or you can do a Freedom of Information Act. Right. And if you go in person, I would do the Freedom of Information for, Yeah, Act. yeah, you do that first. You don't send the lawsuit first. You do the, <laughs> you would do the request. Uh, the, uh, the Freedom of Information Act works really well for code violators also mm -hmm. um, in any kind of pushback on public records. Yeah. All right. Hey, Max. How you doing, sir? So what is your most effective marketing strategy for acquisition today? Um, and I guess what's... I guess your lowest cost acquisition and which one has the, the best profit margin? That's one. The second question is, have you looked into kind of the future of where your marketing dollars is probably gonna be best spent in the next few years that you have more competition coming from companies now like Zillow and Open Door that are offering um, these type of products that wholesalers offer? Yeah, so the first answer is, if you, anybody ever watched any of my stuff, when somebody asks me what's my best list, what's my best strategy, I tell them it's consistency. That is my best marketing strategy ever. You know how many bandit signs I see go out in one week and the next week they're never out again, right? We literally have a system where we put out 100 bandit signs every Friday evening, right? And we've been doing it for I don't know how many weeks. We may have missed a couple weeks in between there and there. Right. So if you want to go after tax delinquent, you need to call X amount of tax delinquent every single week. If you're mailing, you need to consistently send your mail every single week or whatever strategy that you have. But consistency is the best thing, because here's how I look at wholesaling. There's a window and this window is always moving left to right, down and up. And us as marketers, because that's what we are, we're throwing marketing material to this homeowner and they're on the other side of this window, right? And eventually, if you keep throwing, you're gonna hit the bullseye and go through the window, right? And, it, and what that opportunity is, is, is an opportunity. So for example, if a guy has a rental house, how many of you guys own rental houses here? Keep your hand up if you've done an eviction before. Okay, so if you ever have a guy that owns a rental house and the window's moving and you literally hit him three days before he goes to court, to do the eviction on a house that he hasn't had money coming in the last three months and he knows they tore it up. He is more likely to sell to you if you consistently hit him. But if you only hit him once there, once there, you're not gonna get it. So the consistency with the window of opportunity is the best marketing strategy that you can ever have. Listen, I know guys that kill it with mail. I don't mail. I know guys that kill it with bandit signs. I know guys that kill it with cold calling. I know guys that kill it with door knocking. So I know some, in every marketing strategy that you can name, I know people in this business that dominate that strategy. It's because they're consistent at it. So pick one or two things and be, be great at it. Like I know the probate and the tax system so good in North Carolina that I can give any lady or any man working at that courthouse a day off. <laughs> right, because I literally took the time to learn it. And that's what I say, the best profit margins, sometimes I'll do a water list and I'll make, you know, $35,000. Sometimes it's probate. Sometimes I get a bandit sign and I make 50 grand. So I can't tell you what's the best one. Now the list that I do like the most is tax delinquent probate and water. And I usually find them all together usually. They're usually all lined up, right? And then about Zillow and Red Door, listen, these, I go back to what I said earlier, these are technology companies that raise money, that never make a profit, right? I know in Arizona, I know a guy who works at Open Door, they try to flip houses and make $4,500. That's their margin. How long do you think that's gonna last, flippers? That ain't gonna last, right? They're such a big corporation, they can't change their marketing pieces or anything on a dime. The thing about being a small business in a local market, 
you can see changes coming down the, the pipeline fast. So we might do RVM this month and see that mail might work better now because everybody's calling. Right? So they don't have that ability to do that. Because they got hundreds of millions of dollars to market doesn't mean anything. They don't know how to use it right. You know your market better than anybody at Red Door or Redfin or Zillow or anybody like that. So don't worry about quote unquote competition. Let them buy and let them go out of business because eventually they will collapse too. Okay, another question? All Thank right, you. got a couple of them over this way. Carly, our lawyer wholesaler. Can you pass this over to her? When do you consider a lead dead? For how long do you follow up? <laughs> Uh, so we have like a, I don't even know if it's really a policy, but it's usually about, about 12 phone calls is about no good. Um, you'll know when somebody is really not interested. Yeah. It usually, <laughs> usually ends with a F you or somewhere around there. One of those things. But you, I mean, you, you'll know when somebody's truly not, somebody can say, hey, look, man, I'm not interested in selling anytime soon. Okay, great. I'll call you in six months. <laughs> right? So it's just because it's that window of opportunity, but you can judge when somebody's like, not interested. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we use REI Skip. We bought that company back in September uh, when we launched REI Rail. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. No. Sorry. Not REI Rail. Is it REI? Rail? I'm, I'm so, yeah. When we launched our RVM company, we bought the data from them. So we use we use REI Skip as our skip tracing. It's bulk. Um, 250 minimum you have to s send in and we we just we just buy a lot because it's all about data so, REI skip can you pass this over to the young lady from Alabama yes this could be a rookie question I have never done wholesale I am strictly um, I have been strictly flipping, mm -hmm. but this seems like a business that won't have very many deductions. So how do you, what's just going to be your best strategy on how you handle actually I'm learning. Tax I'm, I'm a learning. So I, I set up a self, I, I, let, I set up a self-directed IRA. I put a lot of money in that. <laughs> um, I buy and I keep some properties. Um, unfortunately, Uncle Sam's just going to get what they get. Right. I mean, I, I, I did deck out the office and I did bought a few toys, um, but you know the uh, the main thing is if you if you have the opportunity to spend it and put it back in your business, that's the most important thing. I mean, other than that, I'm still learning. Like I said, this is my first time being rich, so <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> Mm-hmm. We run, we want Well, you mentioned the probate yeah. and all that. So what's your average spend per month and how many leads are you bringing in as an average? So we run a very lean operation when it comes to spending. We're between fifteen and $18,000 a month on just marketing, right? That's very, good. very, very slim numbers. Now, sometimes when I do have a testing budget, I don't know if you guys have, I have an R&D budget of about ten grand a month. And that's just for new stuff that I pick up through going through masterminds and stuff like that that I want to try. So on a, on a real good month, I can spend like 25 or I can spend 18. Um, and then I, I have staff, so you include that. Um, um, I'm not the best at KPIs, to be honest with you. Um, good enough, right? Yeah, it's, I'll tell you, we buy between 9 and 12 deals every month. Probably around, probably there or a little bit less. So but the important thing is there's qualified leads and unqualified leads, and you got to get to the the people that are super motivated, and that's the only number that really matters to me. And the reason and the reason why our stuff's so cheap is we do a lot of cold calling and RVMs. RVMs cost me three cents, right? Um, it takes me three cents to hit a homeowner, and I, and what happens is, is I turn an outbound marketing method into an inbound marketing method. So I only talk to the people that want to talk to me. Right. So between PPC and cold calling and RVM and our bandit signs, those are all cheap methods because I don't have the mail overhead like sending mail. So 
doing those things, you know, we run very slim. Could you tell us what the, the okay. acronyms that you just used, what, what are they for? KPI. Well, I know KPI, but the RVM, R ringless voicemail. Mm -hmm. So we have a company called REI Rail that does ringless voicemail. And the reason why we invented it, because I did a lot of cold call, I did a lot of RVM drops with other services. And the problem is, is I would get a lot of calls back. And people would say, hey, yeah, you called me about your house? And my line was, hey, I'm not in front of my computer right now. Can you tell me what property you're calling about? And it was like, I thought, I, I thought you called me. Mm -hmm. So now I don't look like the small guy anymore. So what happens is we built a software that basically when that person calls back, milliseconds before the call, all their information pops up on a computer screen in front of you. Who they are, the house, the last time it sold, the tax value, the bedrooms, any pictures it finds on the internet, and anything about the person that you can find. So if you worked at Pepsi Corporation, it's on there. Your picture, it's on there. If you got any spouses or kids, it's on there. So we now have a conversation where you can pick up and be like, hey, hey Jim, how you doing? And then have a conversation. My dad worked at Pepsi. Yeah, you know, I see that you worked at Pepsi or bring it up in a conversation. Oh, I'm just sitting back having a Pepsi. That spark, oh, Pepsi, right? <laughs> so just stuff like that, because what happens is there's, there's a trust equation, right? There, you have to break that trust equation, and usually how you break that trust equation is I gotta take you to lunch, we gotta go have a drink or something like that. Well, I'm using technology to reduce that time of having that trust equation. Max, on a, um, can we just go back a little bit when uh, you were broke and you were getting started there. Um, when did you know when to scale and how did you scale? When, when you went from that transition to, mm -hmm. all right, I have some money, now what do I need to do next to start marketing? Putting those dollars in the right spot yeah. and where it needed to be. Because a lot of people, including myself, is when you're starting to, you know, you do it all yourself and then you want to branch off and then you're like, okay, how do I branch off? Where do I want to branch yeah. off? Yeah, so that's a, that, a great question. When I realized that I was having more calls go to voicemail than I was answering and that I was screening leads based upon the voicemail they left, I knew that I was missing out on money. And what I would do is I would go on Zillow and look at all the properties that they talked about and see that they sold. And I would have offered that or I'd have been around there. So I, so I started, I said, okay, I know what I'm bad at. And that's answering the phones every single day. So uh, that was my first hire. Right? I hired Leica, and very simultaneously after that, I hired uh, a VA overseas as well called Alexis. Now, Alexis does all my data scrubbing across any county that I'm working, and she does it at night to also know that we have fresh data in the morning to go out to the skip tracing company. So her whole, everything she does for $300 a week is all about pulling data that we need and organizing it on Excel. I'm not good at Excel. I'm not good at answering the phones. So your, my answer is I fired, peop, I fired myself from things I wasn't good at first, and then I started doing and I fired that. I fired myself from here. God, I don't answer the phones no more. I can go to sleep at night because I don't have to pull data anymore, right? And then I started saying, okay, I need another cold caller. I need another cold caller. I hate going on appointments now. Let me, I, can't, I can't spend all day going on appointments. I need to train somebody to go on appointments with me. All right, let me bring on another person that does it. So eventually you start firing yourself and if you have SOPs or you started documenting your process as you were going, you know that I can just say, yep, here goes all the videos are recorded. Here's how I scrape data. Here's how I answer the phones. Here is my, I wear, I, so all my sales guys, my acquisition guys, we got a microphone from Amazon. It just goes in their shirt on a lanyard and they record every appointment they go on to. And then on Tuesdays, we sit and we talk about, we listen to the recordings of them going on the appointments so we can give them feedback. So I used to do it to myself. So now when I, go on, when I had to train somebody, I said, here goes the last 30 appointments I went on to, listen. And then develop that, that characteristic that I did. They're only gonna be a percentage as good as you are, but if you hire three of them, you know, they're good. Okay. Great question, Steve. <clears throat> Could you work that in Albany, New York, Troy, New York? What's that? You could work that system where you're at in New oh, York. Absolutely. Heck yeah. Max? All right, right down here. We got one here. You want to shout it before he gets there? Go. Go ahead. Shout it. Shout it. Okay, what's the hardest part about your whole business? There you go. The hardest part is hiring and hiring people. It's the, it's the hardest part is scaling and hiring people. Every time I hire a new position, my business takes a dip for a while. 
just because I have to do that massive training and bring the team together, and then it picks back up and you eventually get back where you were, or, and better is the point, right? So hiring, finding people with as much passion and desire as I have about real estate is very hard. I'm not a lazy person, so if, I, if I'm around lazy people, it just bugs me. Hi, Max. What strategies would you utilize as a newbie to real estate when you're entering the market that's predicted to be changed? So when you say predicted to be changed, that means new development is coming, places that weren't so enticed. It may not be as um, lucrative. It may be, you know, interest rates and everything. Things are going to be changing. Shift. The market shift. So when you look at wholesaling from a perspective of solving problems, because that's what we do. We identify problems and we solve them. It doesn't matter what the market is. If the market gets worse, we got more problems to solve, right? So we're just going to buy cheaper and sell cheaper. People that have real money, right? People that's been rich for real, this is when they buy is when the market's down, right? That's why I'm saving cash this time. So I can buy a couple when the market goes down. So real cash buyers will buy from you regardless, as long as it's a trend in with the prices that's reasonable. Who's looking forward to a market shift if it occurs? Yeah, Me? A lot of people, I know. All right, next question, uh, right in the back row here, we'll do you first, and we'll hit Rose, since y'all are right next to each other. When, when you walk into someone's door, yeah. you're ready to make a deal, mm -hmm. to the time that you get them to sign a contract, how, how long do you spend with them, and like, do you do your, um, like a, a brief tour on their house, and, figure this is going to cost this to fix it up and, and do you talk to them about that? so one thing i do is i never bash their house right. right so i don't really talk about pricing unless they're just completely oblivious to what things actually cost mm -hmm. um and i usually don't tell them i gotta replace that i gotta replace that they understand and one thing we set as a president prior to going on appointment is that my staff, my lead managers, they know that you cannot waste the time of an acquisition person sending somebody on an appointment that is not ready to actually sell their house. So we say, listen, I'm not a real estate agent. We're not coming to look at your house. I'm actually coming to buy it. So if you're actually interested in selling your house, does it make sense that we make an appointment? You see? So then we, we knock out all that other, I'm not, I'm not really ready. Will both decision makers be there? Because we're coming with contracts to purchase Right? And I think that's a lot of wholesalers co go to appointments and they don't even have a contract with them. Like, what, do you, what did you go there for? Right? So, you know, we, and so we don't really talk about piece by piece what things cost. You know, when we sit down and we finally have that conversation, usually about 30 to 45 minutes after entering the house, because you have small talk, you want to talk about things and get, the, get to find something in common. I know it sounds cheesy, but it works. Um, and then you want to sit down with that person, usually in their living room or kitchen table. Some people, there's a difference between some people think. Uh, and then you have that conversation, you know, well, you know, Tom, this is going to probably cost me around forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 to fix this. And he's like, forty, fifty thousand? dollars Yeah. I said, I got to get this looking like HDTV. Right? And that's my favorite line. I got to get it looking like HDTV. And that's because, you know, that's what people got understand because you got to understand what they know. I got to spend the money because when somebody with 200 grand comes in here, it got to look like 250 grand. There's a lot there. That was really good. On, but you do have to qualify. You have qualified deeds and unqualified deeds. Mm -hmm. Focus on the qualified deeds. Who is next? Rose? Okay, so I live in Arlington, Virginia, and I know that I have um, some Northern Virginia friends, and they were asking about <clears throat> basically the shift in market. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we're so concerned in the shift in market um, is because our price ranges, you know, I can wholesale a half a million dollar house, it's okay, it's easy there, mm -hmm. you see Maryland, but in Arlington, 1.5 million, where, you know, you have a huge spread, 2.5 million, you know, to resale. So the market shift is such a huge concern because if you end up with a 1.5 million dollar house and then the market shifts, you know, do you have any insight or any advice on something like that? Because the values are so high there, but it can easily, I, I would say, it could easily change overnight for us. Yeah, so you, so you mean as a wholesaler, you have a contract on the house? As a wholesaler, as a flipper, because we do yeah, a lot flip, of the conversions, yeah. too, but mainly the price ranges are so high, that market shift is kind of scary. So I, we are, anyways. I'm not a flipping expert. Um, 
so I would say I'm probably the, the, the more educated flippers are probably not purchasing in that area right now. I would agree. Um, just because the vulnerability of, a lot of people know, you woke up one morning and it was Bear Stearns, the market, and you're holding on to $1.5 million house is worth $1 million now. Um, so I, I don't know from a, from a, from a flipper's perspective because I've never been in those shoes, but I think about it as a wholesaler. And, and typically, you know, a lot of people that never been in real estate before, real estate deals don't happen a lot of times. A lot of people, how many people have sold their house has been on the contract several times before it's closed? Um, so it's common. And I think if the shift happens while you has a contract, there's nothing wrong with going back to the seller and say, hey, look, we made a deal, but I woke up this morning and the stock market's in the trash. And I mean, there's no way I can execute on this deal because your house is no longer worth what it is. If they try to sue you or whatever it is. That's the case. But a good contract, a good tight contract uh, with due diligence money that you put down um, should allow you to you know, walk away from the deal. Yeah, your con your contract's the key. You got to know what your contingency clauses are uh, for sure. Go ahead. How are you explaining um, when you're showing with in buyers? Like you're telling them, I'm the buyer, it's under contract, then you want to have your showing. So how are you explaining that? And then how are you also explaining the fact that it's being assigned? So if they look at the HUD and they see an in buyer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're talking about, good talking about an occupied property? No, she's just saying when you're talking with a motivated seller, you're yeah. trying to explain to them that you're going to be a wholesaler up front and you got to bring people into the house to get it sold. How's that conversation? We set, we Best just, way to approach we, it? I, I, I talk a lot to my staff about setting expectations with the seller. I mean, we're not dishonest with them. Listen, we're investors. We're here to make a profit. That's a conversation we actually do have with them. And there's many exit strategies that we use. I could flip this house. I could rent it. I can go partner with a friend. And if you have that conversation, they don't care. They, all they really care about, if you have a good conversation with them, is how much money am I getting, right? They don't care where the money comes from or you know, how you dispose of it. And if, you, and if you have a good closing attorney, they know how to explain the documents where it just doesn't you know, throw up a crazy, like, oh, she just made $26,000. They're not gonna say that at the table. So as long as they get that bottom line says due to seller, I, th I never ran into a problem. We've done hundreds of deals. And it's about setting the expectation, I think, is the most it's important good, thing. It's, it's a good question because people have that fear. So I'm glad, glad you handled that. This is something, I don't know if they do it everywhere, but mm -hmm. we do it in Texas. I love Texas. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's very competitive. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, after you get a contract with someone, you, you know, we've run into problems where a seller tries to, you know, sell the house to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So um, we file memorandums of contract. Mm -hmm. Do you use those? And <laughs> have you ever had the, um, we have one right now, and there's just a ton of problems with the title. So the closing date has come and gone, um, but the guy can't sell it to anybody else. On top of it, he's a real estate agent. But he did, um, he sold it to, a, he entered it into another contract with a wholesaler and that wholesaler put it on Facebook. So I knew we were gonna be getting phone calls mm -hmm. about the memorandum of contract. So now the seller wants me to remove it so he can sell it, but, and he's threatening that lawsuit. Tell him to bring it. I, that's what I said, have your attorney come on. Yeah, because I've, I, I, I've never had to file one personally. Uh, I've, I'm in a bunch of masterminds and I had friends that filed them and it took them nine months before they got their money. But they eventually know if somebody wants that property, they're gonna pay you. Okay. Um, you should you, get a payday out of that. Yeah. Because you did nothing wrong, you know. You they couldn't deliver title to you like they expected, and it's just delayed. It's delayed. Now there's reasons. There's a lot of wa houses I've walked away from because I just don't want the bad energy. Right. But you sounds like you did everything right. So we're gonna go to Stacy, then Robert. We'll just take a couple of more. Max, you mentioned like the importance of masterminding and being in mm -hmm. the right room with the right people. How big of an impact has that made on, on your life and on your business? So when I started making money, it was probably the single most thing that put, like, just because surrounding yourself with the right people is very important. Um, you know, I've, there, there's masterminds I've paid 25 grand to be in, right? right? But it's, it was worth it. I mean, the first meeting I walked away with enough information to increase my bottom line. And I think that's the most important thing. So masterminds are very important. Why is because you come together with like-minded individuals that have the same goal. Uh, n nobody, has, nobody has any ego in these rooms. And I think that's the most important thing. You, I'm sitting across a guy who's worth $100 million and he has no ego. He's sitting there saying, I gotta reduce my marketing cost. 
well, guess what? I can help you with that. I'm, I, do, yeah. I do a lot of cheap stuff. So you have those, <laughs> you have those type of uh, conversations with people that you probably never get to meet in, in, in outside of a mastermind. So it's very important. Great. And obviously, I agree. Stacey, you were next, then Robert Haggerty. I'm pretty loud, but... Oh, it's all right. I'd love to give it to you. Ted says that. I don't know. I don't agree, but whatever. Illinois, right? Illinois and Atlanta, Georgia. So we do both. Um, so my question is, so we're investors. We buy, we hold, we flip. So we get a lot of wholesalers that send us deals. How do you teach them? Nothing frustrates me more is wrong repair values. Mm -hmm. So what are you telling people that are new how to... I know repairs. I'm a contractor. Yeah. I do our work. Mm -hmm. How do you tell the newbies to figure out repairs? Don't tell me a house that's never been remodeled ten thousand dollars i hate that there's nothing cost ten thousand to repair Thank you, right? um so a uh, thing that we started shifting to is we actually do not add a repair value to any of our deals uh the reason being is because i don't want you to hold me liable to actually uh telling you that hey the re he said the repairs were 50 and i go in there it's 100 and you can if you, if you have that documented there's going to be a potential lawsuit We've just done so many deals and I have that in-house attorney. We try to m mitigate our risks so much. And who cares what I think the repair value is? Because you know, and you being a contractor, you're probably getting cheaper prices than I get anyways. So why shoot myself in the foot by giving you information that you know is wrong when you say, when I say it's 100 grand in repairs, he's like, I can get it done for 50. And I'm basing my value off of that. You just walked away with an extra 50,000. But as, uh, as the wholesaler trying to negotiate the deal, right? So you, you and me, I'm, I'm the mm -hmm. person Negotiate me down. So, so one thing is don't try to educate a wholesaler that's not educated themselves. Don't waste your time. Uh, what I would do in your shoes is sit back and wait. That property will become available very shortly. <laughs> and then you go right to the person yourself. Um, because that, that's what's going to happen. They're going to, they're not, nobody's going to execute that contract. You can send a letter or call them and you can get it on the price for the same, the price that you actually wanted because you're cutting out the wholesaler, but you, you have an educated price on the property. And I tell, I tell wholesalers all the time, you have to know your numbers enough to where you, you're not offering a dumb deal, right? A lot of people are motivated by money and I'm motivated by solving problems. So I don't get houses under contract that don't make sense. Good answer, Stacy. And believe me, Stacy finds dirt cheap houses <laughs> and does a good job of it. <laughs> Uh, who is next? Robert Haggerty. All right, Robert, former firefighter, full-time wholesaler. Like it. And calendar model. Calendar model? <laughs> Congrats on all your success. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Uh, my question is, as a successful CEO of you know, a multi-million dollar company, now, mm -hmm. how much time do you spend working on the business, in the business, and personal development? Um, so here's the thing. I started blocking my time only because I've become uh, more popular in the last year, right? So from 8.30 in the morning to 1 p.m. is when I'm actually doing real estate. After that, I don't do any real estate. Um, and that's all my appointments. Anybody that wants to talk about real estate, anything is done in those time blocks. Um, that's work for me. Um, I read it in some book about time blocking and it's working for me so far. Um, because personal development is important because as the CEO, I have to travel here to go to masterminds. I have to meet with people. Um, we just raised $30 million to do loans, right? So you're, you're, I got to do things that build the company in order to go, you know, make sure everybody gets paid on Friday. So I, I got to be the guy that's running around. So between 830 in the morning and one is when I do real estate and everything else is, is building. There's a good book on, um, Focus is called Deep Work. If you haven't read I think, it, over I think that's it. I think I'm. Deep I think work. I, it's a good book. You'll, uh, so I listen to books now too. So right. I, haven't, I haven't watched sports in over two and a half years. Woo. I don't watch football, no basketball, no anything. Only thing I, I own a bull riding team in the PBR. That's the only sport that I'm actually into right now. No, so, I saw that post on your social media. I did not understand it. Yeah. So I I, I, I own a bull riding team uh, in the uh. professional bull riding circuit. And it's fun. I don't know. I just like it. But it is. <laughs> got time for one or two more. Just really quick. Who's next? Oh, okay. Here you go. Thank you, Max. So I have a couple questions. Yes. Uh, one, do you make any offers over the phone? And the second question is, uh, do you have a double-hold deals? 
So uh, answer number one, we're starting to try to do it. And I have my friends in the much larger markets like California, because of the traffic and all that stuff, they're having to do a lot more offers over the phone and it's working for them. I'm actually sending one of my sale agents this Sunday to uh, California to go, my buddy has a $4 million operation and he's gonna sit with their team. She's gonna sit with their team and actually see how they do it well. Uh, so it, it doesn't work in our market because it's just people just like to meet people. I find. So I'm going to try to learn, see if I can do it, but really no, we haven't done it. Uh, houses when they make sense. Anybody in these small markets where they say, oh, I want 10 grand. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to lock it up over the phone all day long. Right. Um, like I said, we spend dumber things on 10 grand before anyways. So the answer is we're trying to, we're, we're learning to try to do that. Uh, your second question was uh, double closing. You have a double never closing? have, never have. I have, I've done double closings. Sometimes you need to. Generally, you shouldn't need to. Yeah. I never had the All reason the to do it yet. All the assignments are good. Simultaneous closings are good. Once in a while, you might need to double close. Last question? All right. I'm glad you uh, took the opportunity. <laughs> software. You, you talked a lot about different software and stuff mm -hmm. like that that you use. Any others that are out there that maybe you use in your wholesale business that you haven't talked about? <sighs> No, I think one of the most important things is Deal Machine. I, and the reason why I like Deal Machine is when you're heading to the grocery store, you're doing anything, you can literally snap a picture of a house and it automatically sends a postcard for you of the house on the postcard, right? So you, you imagine you getting all this mail in your, in your, you know, we buy houses mail and then you look and you see a picture of your house, right? You're going to be real pissed off. Or are you going to be actually interested to, to do it? So I love, I love Deal Machine. Um, we use REI Rail, which is a company I do own for RVMs. Um, I love Call Rail as well, um, just because I, I have probably 60 marketing numbers out there. Um, you know, uh, skip tracing is very important. List source is very important. Um, that's pretty much it. I don't know. Mojo. All right, let's close with your 30 day challenge. <laughs> How many of you guys are in the room that are in this 30-day challenge? I know some of you guys are. Yep. Good. Challenging me. I think it's an awesome way to start 2019. Um, Can you talk just a little bit about that in closing here? Yeah. So on social media, what I did starting on the 15th of January is I started a 30-day challenge. And every morning, I give out a task to do something uh, to 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 be able to get your first deal in 30 days. Now, a lot of people think it's very complex to get your first deal, but one thing that I talk about a lot is consistency. So every morning at nine o'clock, except for this morning, because I was driving, um, I, put out, I put out a something, a tip for them to do, basically homework. I say, go complete this today, report back tomorrow. Um, it's, it's just a free thing. I like giving back, you know, to, you know, what, here, what's, here's what real estate's done for me. Um, it, it's allowed me to help my brother go through college, my sister go through college. I've been able to partially retire my mother. Um, you know, I've been able to set, set her up, uh, uh, you know, so she can retire properly. You know, I've been able to do those things that I never thought that I would be able to do. So it, just having that and having being able to do that myself, being able to teach somebody, teach anybody to go out and do what got me financially free, I think is just, I think I'm required to. I think God's requiring me to give back, right? So it's, it's just something I love doing. I, I don't make money by, you know, selling a course or anything like that. I literally just like to give back. Um, I just bought a 5,000 square foot warehouse where, I'm, where I built a new creative space. So I'll be shooting a lot of my videos in there. Um, and it's all for free. So I don't, I don't plan on monetizing that anytime soon. I just, I just love the feeling of giving back. And somebody gave to me whether they know it or not. And it's made me who I am today. So you're not still living in your mom's attic? No, no. <laughs> but I did pay the house off. <laughs> so that's Max's heart. And that was like what we talked about before we hit record on my podcast. And that's what led to him being here today. Yeah. So I just wanted to say thank you. I mean, I've got to respect your time, too. I know how in demand you are. So um, thank you very I much. It, man. You guys thank have you so a much. good time. You want to get our picture? Yeah, absolutely. Come on. So then I also talk about the reason why I hold the one up is I say that everybody's one deal away. And, yeah, uh, and the reason why I say that, I don't mean you're going to quit your job with the first deal. What I mean is that you, 
You know, a lot of people get involved in the rat race and they feel like that's the only way out. And what happened was, is the one deal away where I made $14,000 and I, spent, I made it in three weeks, it made me realize how valuable my time was. So I started valuing time and, and money and understanding and that allowed me to change my whole mindset to where I am today. So that's when I say one deal away, that means you're one day deal away from changing your life and other people's life. And believe me, being rich or being, I'm not wealthy yet, but having money is, if you don't wanna be rich, you're selfish. Because being rich helps more than just yourself. Um, I've, I've been able to give back a lot, help my mom, my brothers, my sisters. I have all these employees. You know, it's, it's good to see them. You know, I love it when an employee pulls up and I got a new car, you know, it just makes me feel good. So um, being rich is more than just yourself. I have enough passive income to live off of for the rest of my life, but I'm going to keep growing so that I can give back. So Rich, do you remember your first deal you got? Wholesale, $10,000 off Craigslist. That's what I had a flashback to right there. Change of life, right? First deal, right? And it's good. Um, and then Hustle Club. It's important to hustle. Tom <laughs> yeah. talked yesterday about not being lazy. You weren't here, but the hustle club plays right into that. It's yeah. Because I, I talk a lot about, um, I spoke at a women's conference not too long ago, and I talked about the average salary for a woman in North Carolina was around $33,000. And what I did is I bought $33,000 cash and put it on the table on stage. Wow. And I let people see that this is what they say you're worth every year. And um, so Hustle Club is basically, if you believe that your eight, nine, 10 hour job, you know, you put more energy into that than yourself when you get off. There's, there's, there's so much time in a day. There's 24 hours of time in a day. And if you, you could still get your six to seven hours of sleep, still work an eight hour job and still dedicate a lot of time. Even if you have a family, you can still dedicate a lot of your time to becoming who you actually want to be and get out of that dead end rat race job because that's not what the American dream is. I promise you. Good closing? Yeah. All right, guys. Here's what we're going to do.